Hey, gang. Thank you very much. Standing room only in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to Birmingham Southern College and to the Stump Lecture. Uh, if there's ever a man that did not need an introduction, it's the chairman and CEO and president of Federal Express. I mean, here's a man who literally has lived and made the American dream. And uh, he built, through his vision, the world's largest transportation company. And, and we all are very proud to have him here. But that's not the Fred Smith I know. Not at all. Uh, I, I can close my eyes and see the Fred Smith I know. And so I want to give you a little background on this man uh, that he'd never really share. Uh, he graduated from Yale and upon graduation from this prestigious college and university, left, and instead of going into business, he went to serve his nation as an officer in the United States Marine Corps. And uh, shortly after joining the Marine Corps, he found himself uh, fighting in the rice paddies of South Vietnam commanding a Marine infantry platoon, probably one of the most dangerous jobs to have in warfare. It was not enough that he did this one time, but after he returned from that 13-month uh, tour, a short while back in the United States, back over to Vietnam the second time, this time as a Marine captain commanding Kilo Company 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, uh, down in the Anke area of South Vietnam, which is a very, very deadly place to be. Not only did he do that, he also served as an aerial observer, flying over 200 missions uh, above enemy forces, calling in air and artillery strikes. During his time there, uh, earning our nation's third highest decoration for valor, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, and two Purple Hearts. Uh, we're talking about a, a remarkable, remarkable individual who in the rice paddies of Vietnam and under the crucible of fire, built leadership skills, understood the importance of a vision, understood what it means to care for your people, and as a result had a foundation that built this magnificent Company. And so it's a, a tremendous honor for me to introduce to you a dear friend and a United States Marine, Fred Smith. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, before I uh, start the, the program, let me say to General Krulak, I appreciate that very kind introduction. Uh, for those of you who uh, know me, uh, you'll know that uh, behind only my pride in my family, uh, I am most proud of having served in the United States Marine Corps and owe that institution a great deal as I will describe to you in just a little bit. And uh, among the reasons that I am uh, proud to have served in the Marine Corps is because we had people like General Krulak as uh, senior officers that rose to the rank of uh, commandant and uh, because of the invaluable lessons that it I learned in the Marine Corps, which has had a huge effect on the third area of my life that uh, caused me a great deal of pride, and, and that is FedEx Corporation. Now, I can promise you I have been uh, thrown out and booed out of a lot of places, so I'm smart enough to know to bring my own crowd with me, and I, <laughs> I'm going to talk tonight uh, uh, about uh, FedEx 
I'm going to show you a little, uh, a little DVD with a little um, tongue-in-cheek uh, comment or two in there. Uh, then I'm going to tell you something about our company and, and uh, how we operate. And third, the general asked if I'd speak a little bit about uh, leadership. And then the fourth and probably the most important thing that I'm going to do you know, with this microphone right here is to answer any question or a reasonable number of questions that you might uh, have about FedEx or what we are seeing around the world, and uh, we are a pretty good barometer. So let me, uh, as I said, <clears throat> I'm most proud of my family. I have my daughter Kathleen with me. Stand up, Kathleen, just for... <clears throat> so, <clears throat> And as I, I, I told you, I, I bring my own crowd with me. Will the FedEx teammates in the audience stand up? There we go. I can assure you that the only reason I'm up here are because of the efforts of those men and women and the other 300,000 FedEx team members just like them around the world. So let me start off with, uh, with, a, with a little two-minute uh, DVD here and uh, set the stage for uh, what I'm going to tell you about FedEx. Now, if I can operate this thing correctly, uh, let me tell you a little bit about, uh, about FedEx. Uh, FedEx is a, a $43 billion uh, transportation and logistics uh, operation. It uh, I might not be doing this thing right. What am I? Did I get it? Yes. The mission of FedEx is uh, to produce superior financial returns for our share owners <clears throat> by providing high value added logistics, transportation, and logistics services through focused operating companies. We're going to do our business in the highest ethical and professional way we can. Safety will be the first consideration in everything that we do, which is a good idea when you're operating 95,000 trucks and 700 airplanes. We'll try to develop a mutually rewarding relationship with our team members and our partners and suppliers, and customer requirements will be met in the highest quality manner appropriate to each market served. We have a very simple uh, statement of what all of the FedEx folks in, in, uh, in this audience will uh, be able to repeat to you, and, and I hope if you walk up to a FedEx team member any place around the world, you'll um, ask them, tell me what the purple promise is, and they'll say to you very simply, my job is to make every FedEx experience outstanding. Doesn't make any difference whether you're a pilot, you're an aircraft maintenance technician, you're a FedEx Express courier, you're a FedEx uh, ground team member, or you're driving for FedEx freight or working at FedEx office or one of our wonderful sales or marketing professionals. It's uh, directly the job of everybody in our organization to try to make every FedEx experience outstanding. Our strategy is pretty straightforward. And uh, that is that we'll compete collectively by standing as one brand worldwide and speaking with one voice. Our operating companies will operate independently by focusing on our independent networks to, disp to, to uh, meet distinct customer needs. It's not dissimilar to why America has a Navy and an Air Force and an Army and a Marine Corps. They're all important branches of service, but each has a particular mission and each operates within the overall umbrella of the, of the Defense Department. And last and maybe the most important, we'll manage collaboratively by working together to sustain loyal relationships with our workforce, our customers, and our investors. We're very proud of what our folks have done. We've won a lot of awards. Some of you may have seen it uh, recently. FedEx was named by Fortune number six of the world's most admired companies. We've been in the top 15 for the past 10 years. Uh, we're among the world's best multinational workplaces. 
uh, Reputation Institute in 2011, where we're number seven. Uh, lots of workplace awards in Central America, Argentina, Brazil, and so forth. And I'm very proud of the fact that uh, the company has been recognized for our leadership ranks. The history of the company is, um, as you saw in the film there, uh, we began as Federal Express with small uh, Mist Air or Dassault uh, DA-20 airplanes. Uh, one of these airplanes is, uh, could fit inside the engine of our new 777 uh, <laughs> express freighters. Uh, we were incorporated in 71, and in April of 73, we began operations um, to 25 U.S. cities, and we carried 186 whopping packages, and I'm relatively confident that half of them were shipped by our uh, then very tiny sales force, one to another, just to make sure we had something on board those airplanes. <laughs> Yesterday, approximately 8.5 million shipments moved through the various uh, FedEx networks. And um, that's a result of a lot of things that happened between 1973 and 2012. In the mid-1970s, we were working very hard to get the government out of regulation of uh, air transportation, which they did during the Carter administration. That allowed us to, to expand and uh, to, to meet our customer needs uh, better. In 1989, uh, we acquired the Flying Tiger Line, uh, which was a, a venerable uh, flying tramp steamer company, you might describe it, set up by uh, some World War II veterans that had been in, in Asia for a long time. And in those days, the aviation business was heavily regulated internationally, even though the United States had deregulated it. And we acquired Flying Tigers not so much for their business, because our vision was to put in a worldwide door-to-door uh, scheduled Air Express network, but to get the tremendous talent, the air rights, the landing slots, and the facilities in very congested airports like Narita and Osaka and Seoul, Korea and Hong Kong and so forth. In 1995, uh, I think really before people realized what a big deal it was going to, to be, China was on our radar and we acquired some air rights that the, the Department of Transportation had given to a, a U.S. Uh, charter company called Evergreen. And today, FedEx Express is, our, uh, is the largest uh, transporter of goods by air to and from China. And I have to say, General, that one of the reasons I was so focused on Asia was as a result of our mutual experience in Asia, I was very convinced if the entrepreneurial uh, proclivities of the, the Chinese and the other people in Asia, which we had seen as, as young people were ever unleashed, it was going to, to change the world. And to say that has happened would be an understatement, as we've all watched in the last few years. In 1998, we expanded again uh, <clears throat> by buying uh, caliber systems, the biggest part of which was the second largest ground parcel company. Uh, UPS by far was the largest uh, ground parcel company, had been in business almost 100 years. Uh, we, by that time, had become far and away the largest air express company and the largest uh, air cargo company around the, the world, but in part because of our tremendous expansion using the air rights that we had gotten in the Flying Tiger acquisition. and following the tremendous growth of first the Asian tigers, Singapore and Taiwan and Hong Kong and Malaysia and Japan, and then later, of course, uh, China, as I just mentioned. In 2000, after we acquired um, RPS, we came up with a new organizational structure uh, and a new branding system. And FedEx Corporation today has uh, a number of operating units, four main ones, FedEx Express, the original Federal Express, FedEx Ground, which was the rebranded RPS company, 
FedEx Freight, which is the largest less than truckload freight company in the country. There are two kinds of, of freight companies, one where you hire a truck by the mile and the other which has a network that moves uh, freight on skid. And uh, we acquired uh, Kinko's, which was the uh, iconic corner copy shop uh, and rebranded it FedEx uh, Office. Uh, we adopted a branding convention that's somewhat similar to the, that used by the Coca-Cola company. And this was a big issue to us because our express company has a very clear set of expectations on the part of the customers, and that is we move the most critical and high priority cargo known to man. It might be a defibrillator for uh, a surgical procedure. It might be a part or a piece for an airplane that's on the ground. It might be a small piece of machinery that gets a factory operating, and our customers expect us to deliver absolutely positively on time, every time. FedEx Ground on the other side of the coin are not handling in the main those types of, of goods. They're handling the lower value added items that might be going to Walmart or CVS or Walgreens to the hardware store, something that requires dependable and very low cost uh, solutions, but which doesn't require time certain delivery, but the customer expects day certain delivery depending on the, on the distance. In uh, addition to those acquisitions, as I mentioned, we uh, bought the other companies, and as I said, we sort of used the Coca-Cola system. As you know, Coke Classic, the good stuff with the sugar in it, is in a red can. <laughs> the the one that's got a little kick, uh, the Coke, uh, the Diet Coke, is in a in a platinum or a silver can. The Coke, uh, which doesn't uh, have any caffeine or sugar. Uh, is in a, in a gold can and so forth. So our issue at FedEx was how did we need to convey to everyone that it was one company, but there were subtle differences. The Navy uses a system like this on its aircraft carriers where uh, one of the, uh, the sailors on the deck is in a red jersey and another one is in a purple jersey and another one is a green jersey. It looks sort of uh, chaotic to somebody that doesn't know what is going on, but everybody on that carrier deck knows exactly what the mission of the person in the red shirt is or the green shirt, they're either refueling or armaments and so forth. And so everybody inside FedEx understands very clearly in part because of this branding uh, convention that they're all part of FedEx, but they each have their distinct and critical mission. And that tracks back to that strategy, which is, which is quite unique. FedEx Services is, is sort of our um, uh, Department of Defense, if you will. It uh, provides the common IT support. Uh, our sales force works for services but can sell all of the FedEx brands. Our uh, retail uh, company rebranded, as I mentioned, uh, to FedEx Office uh, is part of FedEx Services. All of our technology people are there. Our customer service folks are part of, of FedEx services in a, in a subsidiary we call FedEx Tech Connect, uh, which you might be interested to know, employs more home customer service agents than any other enterprise in the world, a lot of whom are, are handicapped and who otherwise uh, couldn't maintain employment. We're very, very proud of that. The way we're managed is a little bit like uh, General Krulak did in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, we, we have a, a governing body uh, with a chairman up at the top uh, that uh, helps set overall uh, strategic direction of the, of the company. And uh, of course, we in turn work for the board of directors who represent the, the share owners. And this is the, the team I work with on a daily basis great group of people, and I can assure you, just as I mentioned when I started off my remarks, uh, FedEx is, is not a one-man show in any way, shape, or form. It is a team effort, and it takes all 300,000 of us working every day, and it takes the 10 people in this strategic management team to manage an operation that is as, as large as FedEx has become. 
FedEx Express, which is uh, our original company multiplied many times over, is the largest express transportation company that provides uh, fast, reliable delivery to every address in the United States and to more than 220 countries and territories. We serve 375 airports with almost 700 uh, aircraft. It's the largest uh, cargo aircraft fleet in the world. It's the largest jumbo or wide-body aircraft fleet in the world. We're Boeing's largest customer by far for this magnificent new 777 uh, freighter airplane. Uh, when I was out in uh, Southeast Asia as a young man, if you had told me that uh, we would be able to take a twin-engine airplane, put 100 tons of the most critical cargo that you can imagine uh, on it in uh, Guangzhou, China, which would have been inconceivable to me at the time, or take Hong Kong, which was uh, British at the time, and fly it nonstop into Indianapolis or Memphis into the central part of the United States and deliver items door to door to any address in the United States, in some cases before they were picked up. This is what we call our back to the future <laughs> operation because of the international date line. I guess I would have supposed that was really before there was too much smoking of something going on, but I said you would have been drinking something for sure. I wouldn't have believed it. Now, as part of our FedEx Express segment, we also have our supply chain group that manages uh, warehouses and people's inventories, critical medical supplies. We forward stock items that are necessary to to keep the critical infrastructure of our customers operating, whether it's generating plants, hospitals, aircraft, or, or whatever. And FedEx Trade Networks is a subsidiary of FedEx that offers sea transportation and is the largest customs brokerage uh, company. Uh, this is a picture of a FedEx supply chain uh, installation and uh, our trade networks uh, moves a tremendous amount of, of sea freight, uh, which moves less time critical international shipments across the oceans and then inserts them into FedEx Ground, our ground parcel company, or FedEx Freight for uh, palletized items that need to move on the uh, ocean. Our largest, uh, our second largest company is FedEx Ground it's headquartered in Pittsburgh. This is the company we acquired in 2000. It's now the second largest ground parcel uh, company. And we use the same methodology, the same playbook, if you will, that we used in the original FedEx Express in terms of upgrading its service capabilities so that today, in almost uh, a third of the lanes which we serve, we are one day faster than our competition. And we have deployed uh, significant technologies in place to allow us to manage a ground parcel company as close to the original express company as, as is possible given the customer expectation for low cost transportation. We're also heavily involved through FedEx Ground in the e-commerce revolution, Amazon.com, Walmart.com and so forth with FedEx Smart Post. This is a system for relatively lightweight non-urgent items that uh, require very low cost delivery, mostly to the home. We pick the items up, transport it through FedEx ground, and then we insert them into some 35,000 postal units and they're delivered with your mail. This is a very fast growing uh, service that FedEx offers and is extremely popular with uh, the internet uh, retailers. As I mentioned, FedEx uh, Freight, is the largest uh, LTL company. Uh, it has uh, about, uh, I think, uh, 400 individual operating centers around the country. Uh, it moves more industrial items for uh, automotive production, uh, the movement uh, uh, of items that may be going into home building, uh, structures, uh, uh, facilities, uh, construction, and, and things of that nature. It's the heavy stuff, and uh, even though uh, it's, it's heavy, uh, it has the same kind of uh, technology and the same type of money-back guarantee that we pioneered with the original FedEx e Express. 
We have a couple of uh, specialty operating companies as part of, of FedEx Freight. <clears throat> One of them is Custom Critical. Custom Critical carries, just as the name implies, the most critical items that required customized handling. It might be uh, an invaluable artwork going to a museum. It might be a critical uh, movement of medicines for the Center for Disease Control. Uh, after the 9-11 tragedy in New York, Custom Critical uh, brought all the booties that were put on the uh, dogs that were used and so allowed them to traverse all over the, the wreckage. Uh, from everything that you can imagine, the, the most uh, high priority specialized cargo is moved by uh, FedEx Custom Critical. Uh, General uh, Krulak was mentioning on the, on the uh, 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 there we go, went back on our FedEx freight, we have both a priority and an economy service, uh, as we do in our express company, and the economy service, which is moved long distance at a very economical price, are put on these uh, multimodal rail containers and move with our rail partners, the Burlington Northern and the Union Pacific, on whose board General Krulak sits the CSX and the Norfolk Southern in the eastern part of the country. As I mentioned, uh, we have a common sales unit, uh, which um, uh, gives one face to the customers. Uh, they don't want to be dealing with four different sales reps from FedEx, Ground, Express, and, uh, and Freight. Uh, we have one person that can basically handle uh, anybody's needs. This has never been done before in the transportation and logistics arena and our management structure and our strategy is quite unique. And within our culture, it, it, it is working fantastically well because we have gained a tremendous amount of market share being able to offer this uh, broad portfolio of, of, of services. Also as part of FedEx services, as I mentioned, is our retail network. Uh, FedEx office is uh, the Kinkos on steroids. Now, what do I mean by that? It was actually uh, set up by an entrepreneur years ago as a corner copy shop around colleges. But what began to happen uh, is that uh, the old analog world began to disappear. And so what they did was to put in place a, a digital network that connects all 1,800 of the FedEx office stores and which you in turn can connect with either by going in the door where you can ship FedEx Ground, FedEx Express, uh, use the, the digital copying machines, walk up to one and point your, your uh, composition in it and press the button and have it printed out. Or you can sit at your desktop or on your iPad and go to FedEx office, print online, and compose any type of, of presentation that you'd like to put in in uh, tangible form. You can choose the fonts, you can choose the colors, you can choose the separators, you can choose the bindings, and you can print it out in one FedEx office location, or you can print it out in 1,800 FedEx office locations simultaneously. It's an extraordinarily interesting uh, application and piece of software. So I commend it to you for those who procrastinate to the last minute doing your term papers and <laughs> so forth. As I mentioned, FedEx Tech Connect, uh, that's our customer service unit. Uh, we also uh, do something very unusually. We're the largest user of mobile computing devices in, in industry. And so years uh, ago, because we were so unique in this regard, we began to repair our own uh, uh, equipment and we now offer this service to some of our biggest customers and our biggest manufacturers, the biggest manufacturers of technology products use FedEx Tech Connect to uh, repair and turn their um, mobile devices or for that matter almost any type of small office device, digital device in less than 24 hours. Just like most uh, businesses, uh, technology is a huge part of our um, story. Uh, we have uh, about 7,000 people in our IT uh, units around the world. We have one of the most advanced uh, uh, IT facilities ever built in Colorado Springs, another in Memphis, in Brussels, in uh, Singapore, 
and several other places. Uh, technology has been the heart of, of FedEx from the get-go for the very simple reason that absent using the digital technology that in fact created the need for FedEx, the requirement to move high priority, very important items, there is no way that we could manage and meet that purple promise for those eight and a half million shipments per day. So we have been a technology leader for many, many years and have been recognized over and over again. Uh, FedEx.com uh, is one of the largest internet applications in the world. It was one of the first internet applications of the world. And one of my old partners, Jim Barksdale, our chief operating officer, actually is the man who unleashed the whole thing when he went out as the CEO of Netscape uh, and introduced the first browser. And we were one of the first uh, enterprises to move onto the cloud and put applications so that people could use them on their laptop or now on their handheld or whatever the case may be. We've migrated this kind of technology down into the shipments themselves, not just tracking items. We have devices now that can fly along with an item. You could actually track them as they go across the ocean. It can tell you whether the item has been subjected to G-forces, whether it's been subjected to light, what the temperature has been uh, for the whole transit. Uh, and it's, it's quite a remarkable uh, piece of technology. FedEx trade documents made simple what used to be extremely difficult and hard. A crossing a border used to be arcane and very formidable to a lot of uh, companies, particularly small companies. Now you can go on FedEx.com if you want to ship to Bulgaria or you'd like to ship someplace uh, uh, in the most uh, remote part of the world, you can pull it up. It'll tell you exactly what to do so you can sail through, through uh, customs. And uh, uh, our system is incredible in terms of the interactivity that's going on every day. We have about six and a half million package tracking requests daily. I bet everybody in here has tracked a package. It's so routine today, it, it's, it's, you almost can't believe that the world didn't have a tracking system for packages not too long ago. Well, FedEx is the one that invented it, and how we did it is quite an interesting story. Ivan by itself with some great IT uh, pioneers uh, where we had to miniaturize devices to allow them to be handheld and then transmit the data from the trucks. We had to invent a whole new printing industry with R.R. Donnelly, which had never been done before. And today, of course, uh, people can uh, see items in motion routinely like these six and a half million inquiries into our system. It's not because the packages are late. We have very few that are late and even an infinitesimally smaller number that are missing for one reason or another. It's because the ability to track packages or track your shipment for the first time in human history allows you to manage inventory whether it's at rest or in motion. If you think about it, a warehouse doesn't have much economic value. I don't think anybody in here was sold on buying your new automobile by the salesman convincing you that they had the most gorgeous warehouse in the county or in, the, in this part of the country. They convinced you to buy it because the thing was reliable and if you needed a part, they could get it to you very quickly. So a warehouse's only function is a place to put something so you know you got it. And in the days before FedEx invented this type of technology, that's exactly what people did. They went in their warehouse and they counted everything on the shelf so they knew they got it. They knew they had it in their inventory. Once we invented this, you could manage inventory, whether it was in one of our 550 mile an hour airplanes or one of our 55 mile an hour trucks. And it revolutionized the, the, the world. For those of you who are economic students, let me give you a factoid which will really uh, interest you. Prior to the deregulation of transportation, which began largely as a result of FedEx's efforts and others uh, to deregulate air cargo air transportation and then followed by passenger air transportation, by interstate truck transportation in 1980 and then preemption uh, of state regulation of transportation in 1994, Logistics costs, which were the interest on inventory of every business in America, the cost of the warehousing, 
the obsolescence, if you had stuff that you kept too long and you couldn't sell it, and, and, and moving all of this stuff around was about 14 cents out of every dollar of our GDP, 14 percent, almost 15 percent. As a result of deregulation and the invention of these uh, real-time shipment tracing technologies, logistics costs in the United States in the succeeding 20 years went down to a little over 9 percent of GDP. So all of the social benefits, the Medicare, the Medicaid, and all that sort of stuff, were actually made possible because of the improved productivity of the national economy due to these uh, amazing uh, developments in, in, in the Congress and because of the technologies that allow people to manage inventory at rest or in motion. Like the company, our IT uh, professionals have been well recognized uh, for their um, tremendous capabilities. Uh, our CIO, Rob Carter, comes from a long line of great CIOs. Uh, I think he's arguably the best uh, in the world. He does a lot of uh, free consulting for the DOD and the security folks because of uh, the advanced nature of our uh, system. And perhaps as important as the technology is the management methodologies that we use that we call quality driven management. Now, many of you who are studying business here will know about the quality revolution that began first in Japan, led by Americans, Dr. W. Edwards Deming, who used a lot of quality methodologies that were developed in support of the U.S. war effort uh, and then were essentially abandoned by U.S. industry. And they were picked up by the Japanese. And in fact, in Japan today, the highest award that can be received by a company for the quality of its products is the Deming Award. Professor Duran was sort of his um, uh, double, uh, who, who was also a great pioneer of these quality methodologies. And it was using these types of methodologies that allowed uh, the Japanese auto manufacturers to almost wipe the American auto manufacturing industry uh, out of, out of, off the face of the earth. Uh, fortunately, in the uh, 1980s, uh, people began to realize this. We became exceedingly interested in it, again, because of our exacting expectations from our customers. Now, General Electric calls it Six Sigma. Other people call it different things, but our system is uh, quality-driven management. And it is a system of, of mathematical measurement uh, with the type of information that we can provide with this fantastic technology that requires every manager in the FedEx system every day to try to engineer out, rework uh, unhappy uh, instances for our customers. And the real genius of Deming and Duran's methodology was prior to that time, everyone thought that quality meant expensive. That if you got better, it had to be a Cadillac or a Mercedes Benz, when in actual fact, quality is nothing more than meeting the expectations of the customer. So this type of, of management technique has been at the very heart of, of FedEx's success, uh, which along with our technology has has been extraordinarily Im important to the company. We set <clears throat> QDM goals for every member of management. It's reflected all the way down through the organization. Everybody that's a FedEx manager, raise your hand. Every one of these managers has an SQI goal. That means that their job this year is to drive our uh, customer dissatisfaction, the incidences that, that can create customer dissatisfaction down. Now every FedEx manager that, that has that in their MBOs for this year, raise your hand. Every one of you, okay, good. I'm glad that was the case, I didn't have a chance to ask them. Now probably more important than, than the technology, perhaps more important than our management system is, uh, which will lead me into the to the final segment here is our corporate culture, our, our philosophy. And I know this will resonate with General Krulak because when we were walking over here, 
I asked him uh, how he ended up in this particular institution because uh, this, this is one of the great managers of our time and I can assure you based on my own personal knowledge there are lots of people that would like to have General Krulak do a lot, lot of different things and of course he had a distinguished career after reaching the pinnacles of the United States Marines as a commandant but how did he end up here in, at, in, in this particular institution? And his answer did not surprise me in the least when he said he had these other opportunities, which I won't name. He said it was because of the culture of this place. Because you see, at the end of the day, culture is everything. If you want to know why the United States Marine Corps has been successful for 200 years since 1775 before there even was a United States of America, it's because of its culture. And FedEx is the same way. At the very heart of FedEx is one simple philosophy, people, service, profit. And it's built under the, 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 this interrelated uh, wheel, if you will, that says if you take care of your folks to the best of your ability, if you do the right thing by them, and try to be fair and treat them with respect and cut them in on the action and make them feel part of the team and so forth and you deliver the most impeccable service that technology and the best management methodologies can can produce then you'll produce a surplus or a profit that'll keep you in business and we don't make any uh, apologies for the word profit profit is just like oxygen to a human being or to to any other living creature. Without it, you die. No enterprise that, that exists on the basis of selling a product or a service can do so without producing a profit because you're in the, you're in the process of liquidation. So every FedEx team member understands that this people service profit philosophy is the guiding principle. I mentioned a, a, uh, a terrible example uh, which will resonate um, certainly with the general but to all of you who've watched these um, events in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, we had a 28-year courier in Ithaca, New York, Timothy Baroni. And his son, Corporal Christopher Baroni, lost both of his legs one arm was burned over 80% of his body about two months ago in um, Afghanistan. And a friend of mine that was a general officer in the Marine Corps called me and, and uh, asked if, if I would look into this and make sure that the father was well taken care of and uh, do, we could do anything we want. So I, I called the first line manager in Ithaca, New York and I asked him about Timothy Baroni and did he know about his uh, son. He said, yes, sir, Mr. Smith, we do know about, about Corporal Baroni. We've already uh, given him a, an indefinite leave of absence. We've held a uh, fundraiser for him. In fact, the people from UPS even came and uh, gave some money. Uh, <clears throat> we've applied for a Purple Ribbon Award, which within Side FedEx, remember the common color is FedEx, whether it's FedEx orange for the express company or green, we're all purple. We have a program called the Purple Ribbon Program, so any manager can uh, apply for financial assistance to an individual who's in extreme need. We did it for our folks in Haiti, we did it for our folks in Sichuan, China, we did it for people that were in Tuscaloosa, Alabama in the the horrible uh, tornado and so forth. And he said, we've already applied for a Purple Ribbon Award and I'm told that it will be, be granted. Now, I didn't have to tell that manager to do any of those things. I would have told him to do every one of them or something similar to it had they not been done. But I have to tell you, it was one of the proudest moments in recent history for me because that PSP philosophy was alive and well and it was being run by the first line manager and FedEx Express Ithaca, New York, and the chairman of the board didn't have to do anything but sit back and call Timothy Baroni and tell him that I, we were uh, so desperately sorry about his son. 
Now, the reason that I shouldn't have been surprised is because we put a tremendous amount of emphasis on leadership training in FedEx. And I can uh, tell you uh, that we don't call our manager school the management university or some of the uh, other names that are used in, in corporate America. We call it the Leadership Institute. And the reason we call it the Leadership Institute is because in the service business, if you're not capable of providing good first-line leadership, you will not be successful in meeting those expectations of the customers, particularly if you're in um, the type of high expectation service business than we are. Now, one of the things we do is simply recognize people for doing a good job. Uh, the general, as a Naval Academy graduate, knows uh, this very well in the Naval services in the Navy. Uh, when someone has done a good job, the, the skipper of the vessel often will run up two flags, B and Z. Now, don't ask me where this came from. I'm sure it comes from 1775. But the Bravo Zulu flags to everybody in the Naval Service are very clear in what they mean. Well done and thanks. Thanks for a job well done. And so the, when you see the BZ flags flying, you know that that vessel or that unit has done a good job. So we co-opted that at FedEx because so many times in the industrial or the corporate world, uh, people get caught for doing something wrong, but most of the time nobody gets caught for doing something right. And the first thing they'll teach you in, in the Marine Corps as an NCO or a young officer is you find something to praise, do it in public. You sign something to criticize or choose something out about, you do it in private. And that mistake is so fundamental to so many organizations, it remains astounding to me. So we try to do just the opposite. We have a reward and award systems. If you do something well, a manager can put you in for a BZ check, or a, now it's all automatic in your check. You get a, a small stipend for doing a good job. You get a little plaque, wear a little BZ pin, uh, whatever the case may be. If you've really done a tremendous job as a member of management, you can be nominated for a five-star award. We give humanitarian awards for our teammates that are out there doing incredible things year after year, saving people from burning, burning buildings, getting people off the road when they're in, in trouble. I could go on and on about it. And, and Purple Promise Awards based on exceptional customer service. So if you really track why FedEx has gone from a startup company with 186 packages and 25 cities, and I think it was eight airplanes that first day, it all comes back to that central point of leadership, culture, and philosophy. Leadership is something that is talked a lot about, but very few people understand what it really is, and it's really quite simple. Leadership is the ability of an individual, most of the time an individual in some sort of statutory authoritarian author, authority position, a coach, a manager, an officer, whatever the case may be, that can coalesce the efforts of a group of individuals towards achieving organizational goals. That's all it is. Nothing more complicated than that. This has been known since the time that things were first recorded by human beings. This is no mystery to anyone. The principles of leadership have been taught since time immemorial. Now probably the reason that leadership developed as an art, some people would call it a science and I suppose it's some of both, it's because, unfortunately, the most um, important application of leadership in the, the earliest part of history was in warfare. 
And the military, or its predecessor, whatever it might have been called in, in those long ago times, found out pretty quick if you couldn't coalesce the efforts of the many around the organizational goals that you needed to accomplish, like get the Hittites, stop the Romans, don't let the Spartans overrun us, whatever the case may be, you had a big problem. And so the study of leadership became something that was a central part of ancient societies. And you read the classics and you see these principles of leadership which are taught at the FedEx Leadership Institute or the United States Marine Corps basic school, which is exactly where they were plagiarized from, <laughs> or <clears throat> any of the, of the great leadership intensive organizations, you will find that the same principles are taught in every one of those places. I sent the general a small article that I had written one time about my service in the Marine Corps. I can still recite them from memory. And so can anyone else who has ever been put through that type of leadership training. Set the example. Keep your people informed. Be fair and, and equitable. You know, make sure that they're technically proficient and on and on. But the point is that there is no mystery about leadership. You'll hear some people say, golly, I don't know. How do, how, how do they do that? How does the Marine Corps win all, every time, 200 years. Most people on the outside think it's because it's some Prussian type of organization where you snap your heels and salute. Couldn't be anything further from the truth. The Marine Corps is hierarchical in terms of authority, but in terms of its focus, it's an upside down pyramid. And from the commandant on down, they teach you from the first day you go into a leadership position in the Marine Corps to train for it. Your job is to take care of the troops. That's the Marine Corps. You're just a supporting cast. You're the maestro here while they play the, they play the symphony. And over and over, that's beat into your head, and it's trained in every FedEx manager just like it's trained in every Marine Corps NCO and, and every lieutenant. Now, does that mean that everybody can be an effective leader or an Alexander the Great or a Joe Paterno in his heyday or Tom Watson at IBM? Pick your own charismatic, uh, transformative leader. The answer to that question is no. And one of the things that we do at FedEx is we try to assess people who want to go into management, into a leadership position, and remember as I said, our management school is called our Leadership Institute. And you go through different levels of, 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 of training if, if you can uh, get an opportunity to demonstrate your skills and have a shot at promotion. And in that assessment process, we are very uh, clear-eyed about the individuals and whether they have the capabilities to be a leader in the FedEx system. Some of them cannot. That doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean they're any lesser person than somebody that does have leadership capabilities or proclivities, you might say. It simply means perhaps they're an introvert. Maybe they're Stephen Hawking and we'll figure out the, the, the final theory of quantum physics, or maybe there'll be another Dr. Salk and invent a, an equally uh, important cure for a horrible disease like he did for polio. Or maybe there'll be a, a Beethoven or a Mozart and, and, and be a near misanthrope or a, you know somebody who's quite introverted. But you need to find that out on the front end because nothing is more destructive to a person's ego and sense of self than to put them in a leadership position if they don't have those traits that will allow them to follow those principles of leadership. Because you see, as I told you, if it's so simple, if the leadership principles are there for everybody to read and understand, why do you have so many leadership failures? 
whether it's a famous football coach or it's a CEO in an organization or it's a politician that's supposed to be, you know, the head of a committee looking into this and does something completely opposite. Why does it happen? Because exercising those principles of leadership are hard to do and they require subordination of your own self-interest and perhaps your own predilections for the good of the organization. It's five degrees in Chicago and it's cold as hell at five degrees in Chicago. That wind makes it feel like minus 50 degrees. And you're the ramp manager and you've got a flight running late and you're in the warm shed and your troops need to go out there and de-ice that equipment to make sure that airplane can be handled and the cargo can be moved. I can promise you if you stay in that warm shed and send your folks out there, you might get by with that the first or second time. The third time you do it, for some reason, that plane's not going to get off. I don't know what it'll be, but something's going to get frozen up. Something is going to get not moved to the plane on time. Somebody's going to run into a situation. The first time that you cut Sally some slack because you like old Sally, and George, mm, never really liked George, and Sally's late three out of five days and gets away with it. And George is late one day and you give him a warning letter. You're going to be shocked, but pretty soon everybody's going to be coming in late. The minute you don't keep your people informed about what's going on, why you have to go out in that cold, why you have to be on time, because that's what customers expect out of FedEx, the minute you don't provide them the kind of training they need and expect, the minute you don't tell them how they're doing and give them that kind of feedback, I can promise you the organization is going to level down to the lowest common denominator. So if you don't have those sorts of, of predilections or, or characteristics, then be a Stephen Hawking or a Beethoven or Mozart. But don't kid yourself and, and don't do the disservice to yourself and your career choice and what you decide to do by thinking you're going to be effective managing and leading people because you won't be. You may have a job that calls you a manager, but at the end of the day, you will be lucky to succeed. On the other hand, if you have those capabilities, and there are lots of people that do, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to be George Marshall who I admire probably more than any other person I can think of that I've studied. It doesn't mean that you're going to be one of those um, heroic folks that I mentioned because there's that tiny group of people that have the capability of being transformative leaders. They're the ones that, boy, you want to fast track them up and really put them in charge of, of the organization. But there are a great number of people, if they're willing to learn those lessons of history, if they've got the self-discipline to apply those principles of leadership, I can assure you, you can mobilize the activities and the efforts of a group of people towards achieving organizational goals. And if you are thinking about going into business, or going into some sort of profession that requires that type of leadership. I urge you to hit those books or today, I guess, get on the internet and study these great lessons of history because they're all there to see and there, there uh, is no dispute about what it takes to be effective in that type of position. The only thing I'd urge you not to do is don't kid yourself if you don't have the self-discipline to do them. So thank you very much, and I'll take some questions now.